unclean and the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across from Jordan followed him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we pause now, we want to thank you for another glorious morning, another day to celebrate, and another day to worship you, another day to thank you, another day to understand that all life, all blessings, all good things come from you. We'd ask that you be with Pastor Claire as he brings us our sermon today, and you would have an understanding for each and every one of us that we would hear the words clearly and know the good news is clearly from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning to all of you who are worshiping with us from home, on the road, or wherever you are. It's amazing what Zoom can do for you. Welcome if you're worshiping from another country as well. We appreciate all of you and you're part of us. Visitors that are with us, welcome as well. And thank you for being with us. I want to thank Joe Arbaugh for filling in for me last Sunday when I became ill. I don't like to renege on my commitments. Um, I don't know if that's known about me, but that was a difficult thing to stay in bed. But uh, there was no choice. As I was reading and thinking about the scriptures, and I was playing with come and see last week was what I had intended to entitle my sermon when when the disciple, uh, Nathaniel, calls, I don't have this in front of me, but he calls his brother, and he invites him to follow Jesus, come and see Jesus. I began to follow this concept that Jesus brought a message of good news. And then this week, as I began to read and think about what I would like to share, if I wanted to follow up with that or something different, I was reading in Matthew chapter 4, and I came across this concept or these words that Jesus was preaching the good news throughout Galilee. But just before that, it says Galilee of the Gentiles. This is in Matthew 4, uh, verse 15. It says, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And as a person who understands the scriptures a bit and Jewish culture a bit, I wondered why the land of Galilee was called the land of the Gentiles. Anthropologists and archaeologists have studied and looked and they don't find evidence of a lot of foreign temples. When I say foreign Gentile temples, there are artifacts of foreign gods. But yet, in this land, it was the land of the Gentiles, and Jesus came to preach good news. And the more I thought about that, I said, I wonder what the good news was about, not just the Bible stories that we're all connected with and remember so well, but I started looking back. But anyhow, in the land of of Israel, or Palestine at that time, I began to look back, and some of you are familiar with uh, Josephus, a historian, and Edersheim wrote another book called The Life and Times of Jesus. And I began to read and thinking back over what was the context where Jesus was living. And instead of telling a life story today, I want to talk about history. And I know that that probably is boring, and you're saying, why are you bringing all this on Sunday morning? But here we go. But as I looked at the context, Herod, King Herod, Herod the Great, there were a number of Herods, but Herod the Great, who was responsible for trying to kill Jesus and had killed all the babies in Jerusalem that were over two years old or under two years old, He was a jealous kind of a leader, a jealous kind of a king, and he even went so far as to kill two of his own sons, one of his wives, and some other things like that. Great kind of a guy. But 
that same Herod had remodeled the holy temple and plated it in gold and expanded the Temple Mount. Those of you who have possibly been in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount is this immense archaeological feat of building this Temple Mount, making it flat, going out over the Kidron Valley, dropping off 120 feet as it is or something like that. Phenomenal architectural design. I think the temple walls, they say, are 20-some feet thick. And then on top of that, he built this temple in the time when the Jewish people were living under Roman oppression. And the Roman, Caesar, agreed to allow the Jews to worship if they paid a tax. They could stop worshiping Caesar if they paid an extra tax. And because the temple was so expensive, they were also supposed to pay a temple tax. Sound familiar with us today? Maybe just taxation and taxation. There's gas and there's food and there's... Anyhow. Don't draw too many parallels from my sermon today because it might attach to you and you might think it might be relevant for today. I'm being facetious. And so the Jewish people at that time, it seems they began to marry the politics of government and their worship. And Herod himself then pushed away or abolished the, the priesthood and installed the high priest himself along with the priests that were responsible for the temple because he didn't want any uprising or any subversive language going out from the worship center. And so on one side, the Jewish people were extremely thankful because they had a phenomenal place of worship. And they were extremely thankful because they were given freedom to worship Yahweh as they saw fit. And in the middle of that chaos and the tension, Herod eventually dies and then his kingdom is given to divide it into four and Herod of Galilee or Herod uh, Antipas I think is his name I might have said his name wrong becomes the tetrarch of Galilee and a good politician he was he got into an affair with his brother's wife or his half brother's wife and so he married Herodias and eventually Herodias' daughter danced before him, and he said, I'll give you whatever you would like, and she said, bring me John the Baptist's head. And then she went on to marry her father's half-brother. That is, the dancer. And you think about all of that, and you say, that just sounds like something might happen today. I mean, just craziness going on in the political room. But let's go over to the other side, to the politics of church that were going on. There were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the Sadducees were the literalists, the biblical interpreters who said, we must follow the Bible as it says it is, and nothing more and nothing less. And the Pharisees were more of an oral literature group and remembering the stories of the past and applying them for today. But the Pharisees were really concerned that the church, or not the church, the temple worship had been somehow contaminated and people had begun to worship God, but they had mixed in all kinds of other things and immorality and all kinds of things were going on. And they felt if we're going to be godly, then we've got to get our act together and began to impose, to encourage, and to legislate behavior so that the followers of Yahweh would be holy. And religion became more of a whip kind of thing 
than it was a connection with God. Temple worship was taking place. There was polarity within the worship center. There was polarity in all kinds of corruption in politics. And in the middle of that, here comes this man born of a young girl to a man who wasn't married yet. Jesus of Nazareth. And he begins to preach good news. And that somehow caught my imagination and I thought, that sounds like today. I don't know if you bring the connections, but I'm not being political in this comment, but the reality is we have all kinds of political intrigue going on. We have all kinds of polarities within the church, but Jesus came in the middle of that kind of context and brought good news. And my question is, what was the news that Jesus brought? And I thought, well, we could parse out some things and, and look at some of his teachings and that would be great. And the Sermon on the Mount would probably be foundational if we wanted to play with foundations of teaching and what good news was about. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Not the rich who have given us a wonderful temple with gold plates. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and they haven't quite gotten there yet. They're trying, they're reaching, they're saying, is it possible? But I thought instead I would like to move and think about how Jesus behaved in his actions as he interacted with people in his society, as he connected with people, as he walked with them. And he began to preach a message saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He didn't say, I'm reestablishing the Jewish empire. He didn't say, I'm going to rebuild the temple and make it into some fantastic edifice for everybody to gawk at. He didn't say, I'm going to clean up the priesthood. He said, the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he went on to say, but love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the Pharisee comes to him and says, well, who is my neighbor? And we played with this on Wednesday, and I promised I'd play with it today a little bit. And my wife Beth brought this inspiration or this idea. If you look at the story of the, the Good Samaritan, the Levite and the priest were both concerned about what it would do to them if they helped that man. But the Samaritan was concerned what would happen if he did not do something for that man. And the difference is immense. The priest was taught that he wasn't supposed to get unclean because if he was unclean, he could not go into the inner court. Or if he was unclean, he could not go into the inner court. He knew the religious law. He knew what it meant to follow the commands of the scriptures. And so he was doing what he thought was best. But he had missed the gospel, the good news. Gospel equals good news. Because the man is dying beside the side of the road. It's time to put your religion aside and begin to think about what God would do in this setting. Would he love him or would he let him die? And sometimes I find myself as a Pharisee saying, well, let me make sure that I stay clean because if I connect with those people or that person, what do you think is going to happen on Sunday morning? What are they going to say? Do you think we're going to clean out the church? And I lament how often I find myself 
as a Pharisee needing to change. Jesus heals the man with leprosy. And he knows that the scriptures say he was raised as a Jew. He knows that the scriptures say don't touch a leper. And yet he goes over and he said what is, he says to himself in my imagination, what is best for this man? And he touches him and he is healed. And I don't think he's just healed of leprosy. He's healed of the feeling of ostracization and contamination and being unwanted by the community around him. He is touched and embraced and transformed because the gospel is, was good news for him and is for you and I. And then in a context where Rome was oppressing Israel, imagine this. In a context where the Herod and the others around him were worshiping and somehow honoring Caesar, and the oppression of Rome was so real, a centurion comes and says, my servant is sick. Now, if Jesus had any wit about him, he would have said, well, go find help from Caesar. You're worshiping him. But good news doesn't do that. It turns and he says to the man, what is best for you, what is best for your servant, the servant of an oppressor. And he says to him, your faith. I've done wonders. Go. I'm wondering how often Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would, and his servant was healed at that moment. That's good news. The Galilee of the Gentiles and Jesus himself went into a context where Jewish religion and Jewish presentation of the, of the Holy of Holies and all of that had gotten mixed up in Canaan with Canaan and those around. And yet Jesus begins his ministry in a Galilee of the other. The other side is how it would be translated from Hebrew. The Gentiles. And he says, let's go over to the other side of the lake. The Gentile of the lake. The bad side of the lake. The contaminated side of the lake. Because what is good for them is what God wants to do. And he runs into, he encounters two men who are demon-possessed. And he heals them. That is good news. And then he goes and calls a tax collector who was not only Jewish, but was collaborating with the oppressor and collecting tax so that he could honor that God out there, that foreign, that Gentile God in Rome. And he says to him, follow me. I want to make you a preacher. I'm using modern day language. That's good news. He saw potential in the other person and that's good news. He caught the woman in adultery, or he was brought this woman caught in adultery, and the Jewish laws and the Pharisees knew that she should be condemned. Listen carefully. They were oral literature people, not, or oral tradition people, not exactly as the law was written. <coughs> Think of this. If it would have been a Sadducee, they would have said, the Bible says, or the law says, that you should kill, it doesn't say stone, in Leviticus it says, you should kill the man and the woman. But the Pharisees brought them and said, you should stone him to, her to death. Think of the difference, just nuance. But Jesus brings good news, he brings a transformative message, and he says to the woman who is obviously guilty 
along with the man, in case you're wondering. I don't condemn you. But go and sin no more. And we've talked about this story before. And I, this is the kind of good news that Jesus is giving. And it comes to you should not work on Sabbath or on the, on the Saturday. And here this same Jesus comes. Bringing transformation. Finding a man with a withered hand. And he says to him. Be healed. And he's healed. On the Sabbath. And that's work. According to some. But that's good news. It's what is good for that man that Jesus is after. And my question today is, what does good news look like at this time in history for us? Of Waynesboro? In our nation, in our world? In a world that is somehow polarized and corrupted and all kinds of things are going on. And we see church in a larger sense that seems to be so divided and differing opinions. What does good news for us look like? And the question we need to be asking, what is best for the person that I'm with? Instead of what is best for me? How do I avoid getting contaminated is not good news. The question is, how can I help you? That's the transformative message of Jesus Christ. Salvation starts there. It happens because for God so loved the Jews, the world, all of them, the messed up, the Gentiles, all of those in the land of Galilee of the Gentiles. Good news has been brought. How often I think we need to ask ourselves, do I act as a Pharisee? Thinking about how I might be affected instead of what is best for them. What would Jesus do this week as you walk in your life, as you interact with people, as you, content, or as you encounter people? How do you eat with those who are rejected by religion? How do you embody the, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ? How do you give to somebody what they need? Let us pay attention. Because God will give you the opportunity to show the love of Christ to those around you. What is good news for us? It's not just about what is good for you, but what is good news for those we encounter. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to hear from you and to experience your grace. We pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon us and build in us a sense of your Spirit of good news. And Lord, we pray that you would break down the boundaries or the barriers of a pharisaical worldview that I so easily carry and make me to be a vessel of your love. Good news to a broken world. In Jesus' name, amen.